morning, everybody. Welcome back to the Exponential Finance Podcast. Today, we're very excited to welcome Zia Zaman. Good morning, Zia. Welcome to the show. Hi. Uh, allow me a brief introduction. So you're in a bit of a transition right now. For the past six years, you have led innovation for a global insurer, and that has included delivery of a number of projects and awards that you've won together with your team. Through that, you're globally recognized as an insure tech expert. And so that's certainly something we want to dip into today in the conversation. Uh, you've worked with a variety of regulators across the region. And also you've been very much a champion for diversity and inclusion. You're now turning towards ESG investments and you're founding a sustainability fund and advisory services practice, focusing on impact opportunities in preventive health and inclusion. So two parts of the conversation based on the bio, the past in insurtech and innovation, and then forward-looking social responsibility and impact, which will be very exciting. Before you got into finance, you spent almost two decades in the software industry, two exits, got three degrees from Stanford and MIT, and you had a number of publications. One of the recent one included ice hockey. So ice hockey gives us probably some indications of where you grew up. Lots to talk about. The core question, when you look at a global insurer, it's like this super tanker that seems almost like an immovable object. So when you go in and you're leading innovation and trying to turn the super tanker around, how do you do this? How can you be successful in that? Well, I'm not sure anyone's been super successful in navigating a super tanker in insurance or in, in any other large organization. But what I did when I became the chief innovation officer is I started talking to other chief innovation officers. And so what I recommend to anyone who's been given a digital transformation or an innovation role is to talk to other people. And what I did, Norbert, is I found out there's probably about seven things that you could do as a chief innovation officer, but you can't do them all. So you have to pick and being very careful about what is the platform, company, and what is the time helps you choose which of the things that you're going to do and which are the things that you're not going to do. And so when I started six years ago and I created Lumen Lab, I chose to do three things out of the seven and that gave our team a little bit of focus. And what I strongly recommend is almost all of these kinds of efforts have to do with culture change shifting the mindset. So that was one of the things that I thought that we have to do. The second thing that we chose was ecosystem, ecosystem building. And, and when I just got into this, the word fintech really hadn't taken off. And certainly the word insuretech didn't exist. And therefore, creating linkages with the insuretech players became a big pillar of what we did with the collab program. And then thirdly, we did venture building. We chose to do things because our mandate was business model change. We chose to run experiments that would demonstrate potentially the future of what the industry could be through test and learn. And then eventually some of these ideas, if they were to be de-risked, could be scaled up. Now, this applies not just to insurance companies or to reinsurers, to brokers. It also applies to banks and to any other large organization. Take a look and see what are the different things that you have at your disposal. It might include corporate venture capital. It might include M&A. It might be that you're working on agile. But pick what it is that you're going to do and then you know, set some, some longer term goals and then go do them. Does that make sense? Makes absolutely sense. I mean, you were pretty humble in your response saying you, you're not sure whether you were successful. So how would you measure that? And across these three things you picked, where do you think you had the most impact? Look, I think the end of the day, what we're all hoping for in some of these uh, chief innovation officer roles is what we call an epic win. And the epic win would basically be the following. The idea that we have created a $100 million business or a $200 million business that continues to grow, is sustainable, solves new jobs to be done, maybe even transforms the business model of the company that we're working for. So prior to insurance, just before this particular role, I had the opportunity to build two businesses, actually, frankly, in nine months in my previous company, one had to do with mobile advertising and the other had to do with market research using location data. And because we got so much done, both of these businesses started out and ended up being revenue generating businesses. So it was very rewarding, Norbert. And in a previous role, the same kind of thing. We looked at a new product category and created a new business from either from scratch or from a standing start. To me, that's the epic win that potentially inflates or expands your multiple. 
I mean, the reason we do all this, all of us in the corporate world, is to grow our, our market share, right? And to grow our shareholder value. And then one of the ways in which we can grow shareholder value is by taking that, that multiple that we have, whether it's an earnings multiple or a revenue multiple, and potentially get some expansion there. How do you do that? Well, if an analyst starts to look at your company and say, look, I'm not just going to give you credit for cash that you have in the bank, which is kind of a, a backward looking sort of book value metric. I'm not just going to give you credit for cash that customers owe you or, or that you will earn. That's more of an EV or a DCF type of multiple. I'm really going to give you credit for cash that you might generate in the future because you're an innovative company. And Forbes calls that the innovation premium or quotient. And many other analysts look at a business and say, I'm going to basically ascribe a future stream of cash flows to innovations that perhaps I don't even know exist yet. And the way you get that little bit of expansion from a standard incumbent is that you start creating new businesses. So an epic win inflates the multiple over a long period of time and makes the company potentially more innovative at its core and gives analysts a reason to give you a higher multiple than potentially some of your peers. And effectively, that's what the CEO, she or he really wants is, is that innovation drives market cap. Right. And then, I mean, another way of increasing the multiple is if you reclassify the company. So if I look at Ping An, for example, right, they say, okay, we're actually not an insurance company. We are a technology company. And so you should give us a tech multiple rather than insurance multiple. Again, it leads us back to the super tanker. Is that a realistic objective in your mind, that ambition? Everybody wants to be a tech company these days? You know, I hear that all the time. And I don't think that's really quite accurate in terms of everybody is a tech company. What I do think though, is that technology is so enabling and so pervasive that every company has to master how it leverages tech to deliver value to its customers more effectively. And so you have to focus only, and I think COVID has been great that way. It's been a real focusing uh, mechanism, a lens. What is it that we do to deliver value to our customers? And then you strip away everything else. And how you deliver that value in this time will need to be enabled and rethought and reimagined due to the, the constraints, but potentially as a result of all the different technology that's available. And I don't just mean digital technology, no, but I also mean all the different health techs, et cetera. I do agree with you, though, that when you look at the Ping An story or even a company called Telstra, an Australian telco 20 years ago, what some of these successful companies have been able to do is to say, here's the whole But the sum of the parts valuation means that some percentage of the business you might want to potentially value in the old way. But this, look at this shiny third of the business or quarter of the business it is growing at a different rate. It deserves a different multiple. It has a different type of expansion opportunities. And so what the sum of the parts valuation allows you to do is to say, you've got an incumbent business and you've got this growth business and that growth business can have a, a much larger uh, multiple applied to it. And that is a neat little trick, but one that really is, it's not just a trick, it is an actual strategy that works in helping people think within the company that they're indeed a solutions company or whatever it might be. Understood. Thank you. Let's take a look at the startup side. It's always very hard for a startup to break into an incumbent and work with them, be successful and have a strong commercial relationship. Having been in, in that big company and having built that ecosystem, what is your advice for a startup and insure tech that in this case maybe doesn't want to become an insurer themselves, but are an innovative software provider for the industry? How to make a big incumbent the customer? Great. So I'm going to separate advice into two different parts. The first will be for that insure tech themselves. And I've been a startup before I'm in the tech space. I worked for a Norwegian company that did search. And, and some of the lessons that I learned as a CMO working for a company that was scaling are incredibly useful. And I don't want to get into that because this is not about just simply about how do you grow a company. But insure techs, for all intents and purposes, and, and all the insure tech guys know this, Uh, fall into two different categories. You have the full stack insure techs that basically say we do not necessarily need to have a relationship with an insurer, you know, a, an MGA or a, a broker license, or potentially like Lemonade being an entire full stack insurer, you are in a way more of a competitor or disruptor. But so few insure techs really fit into that categorization anymore. I mean, certainly less than 10%, maybe it's more like 2% of the insure techs I've seen, the 2,000 I've seen, are actually in that category. And you guys know who you are and you know it's, it's, it's great work that you're doing. So the rest of the insure techs 
are basically looking at partnerships, at being part of the ecosystem and delivering value to the insurer. And again, I think there's two types of insure techs that I have seen, Norbert, in terms of ways in which the insurer, the incumbent, can look at you. There's one that's more focused on technology and is seeking use cases, or it's looking, because it's not really from maybe insurance, it's looking for applications of what it can do into a use case that potentially the insurance company can monetize. And so that is your more traditional technology-driven insure tech. And there's nothing wrong with them. One of the companies that we rewarded was called Endor. It's partly from MIT, partly from Tel Aviv. And they do one thing really well, and that is they identify through social physics when two people are very, very similar, like one in 10,000 similar. So if Norbert and Zia are incredibly similar based on some attributes, and if Norbert does something, there's a high probability that Zia will do that same thing. And that, you know, the 9,999 other people won't do it to the same degree of correlation as, as, as Norbert and Zia will do it. And therefore, this is a really interesting technology and doesn't require a lot of personal data. And it is, comes from a breakthrough of the MIT Media Lab. But where's the application in insurance? And so we spent weeks looking at this and saying, where can we apply this? And finally, we got down to policy loans and to say that, if a certain person like Norbert and Zia were correlated and Norbert took a policy loan, well, then let's offer it to Zia because it's very likely that he will need one and take advantage of it because they are so similar in so many different ways. And so that's the kind of company that when you have the technology, then you might find an application, but it takes a combination, of course, of an understanding of the business process of the insurer as well as the tech company. So the advice there to the insurer tech is try to do as many partnerships and think through the use cases and develop some allocentricity. And I'll define that word perhaps a little bit later. On the other hand, you have companies that sort of grew up in insurance. They either had an insurance professional or they're working with a tech professional who worked in insurance or understood some aspect of or targeted something like claims. And there are many more of those. And there, the challenge really is you're taking a very narrow slice of what an insurer can do. And at some point, I kind of estimated that there may be there are 150 little slices of activity that an insurer must do, or this is a life insurer perhaps, from the beginning to the end of the journey. And so if you take this little slice, and I'll use a good French example, which is Shift. Shift does one thing very well, and that is potentially fraud detection and waste detection. And so by replacing the existing way in which you do something as an insurer, to, insurer I should say, this 1 one fiftieth of your business process with Shift, you could potentially quadruple the rate with which you catch a wasteful or fraudulent claims. I and mean, that benefits everyone, you know, claimants and of course, regular policyholders in the business itself. And so the magic here is to be able to seamlessly augment, improve, replace an existing process with the same level of support and endorsement that you currently have in the business to do something better. And that's exactly the story in Japan that we did with our previous company and got the people from being against the insure tech to with the insure tech openly advocating for change because they saw that the metrics that came out of it were incredibly positive for that specific outcome. So that's the advice to the insure tech. The advice to the insurer is obviously going to be a mirror of that, which is you need to better understand the problem that you're trying to solve and then really be open to the different ways in which you solve it. It doesn't necessarily have to be a rewriting in digital form of the existing process. Usually you miss the point there. It's really thinking about what is the customer value you need to deliver in that step? Are there ways of doing it? Are there ways of maybe reorganizing the work and then quickly delivering with the help of the insured tech outcomes? And then you know, cycle through it, go from POC to POC, continue to drive value, do it in one country, move to multiple countries, and the speed or velocity with which you are working with that incumbent is going to drive your future value. Now, if you take these 150 parts that you suddenly have that are in an incumbent, maybe supported by five or six pretty monolithic applications, what implications do you have for the core processing architecture of an incumbent to make it flexible enough to plug all these startups, all this innovation in relatively seamlessly? It's almost like getting the business to agree to that is the easy part, but then if your infrastructure architecture doesn't allow for this plug and play, you still have a hill to climb. 
Yeah, this is a challenge that I started to get to grips with in the last couple of years. It's a difficult one because the natural view would be that innovation would take hold at the edge and not affect that core system and, and you know, the policy admin system and the, the related systems. It took me a few years coming from the tech industry to acknowledge this fact, this truth, which you stated very accurately there, Norbert, which is it's very difficult, even with business advocacy, to technically plug in and make change happen as it starts to connect to the monolithic internal systems. So the previous way of thinking about insure tech for the first few years has been, well, we'll just work on front end systems. Well, we'll just work on you know, waste uh, reduction or fraud detection. So areas where it's relatively isolated, and I won't use a technical term, but where you can exchange information from the beginning of the process and the end of the process, and that just sort of plugs in into that particular form. When it's really to the core of how you do business, I think the answer is you have to rethink everything. You cannot just simply, in a hopeful way, create some sort of intermediate layer with MuleSoft or any other vendor to be able to have this kind of lingua franca between the four and whatever it is, the new stuff out there. I think big challenge that I had in the first few years is I've seen a number of different industries all had the courage or had the incentive to basically rebuild the aircraft while it's still flying. So they would rip and replace, they would do everything that they needed to replace the core systems because they had to. And then I get to banking and it's particularly insurance and I realized that some of these core systems are written in COBOL and nobody bothered because of this idea that it would be too risky to try to do something like that. And in fact, what we're learning, it was, it was actually too risky to not do it. And what's happened is after 10, 20, 30, 40 years of these archaic systems, what you really have is an enterprise risk of being left behind. As much as people do not want to hear the innovation person from outside say it again and again, one of the biggest things that I hear the most from boards and CEOs of venture capitalists and others is the potential risk to the business at its core is accelerated by the decisions that our risk managers are making in the guise of trying to minimize risk. They're in fact accentuating the degree with which you have a, I call it this, a mortality risk for the enterprise as a result of making so many poor incremental choices. So I guess the simple answer, Norbert, is if you're going to do it, have the courage to do it. And I've seen my friends and partners and colleagues from within my previous company and outside my previous company be able to say, look, we're just going to do this different with companies like Axe in Australia, with with, with other companies like Fast in, uh, in New Jersey, and then others that basically allow for a more modular, flexible, and incremental approach to that core past system. Brilliant. I think that's the best description I've heard about this type of problem so far. So thank you for that. Insurance is such an interesting industry for me because the impact of technology is in different degrees. We talked about discussion so far about the impact of technology on the insurance value chain, but then the impact of technology on all the things that insurance actually covers is tremendous. And we talk about self-driving cars, we talk about the whole health insurance space. I mean, the massive change is coming for the insurance product. I mean, if you have self-driving cars, you still have accidents, if you can prevent sicknesses, illnesses, do you have that much health insurance? So what is the future of insurance look like? Where does growth come from? And one of that is maybe by business lines, some other aspect is geographically. How do you see that evolve over the next decade? This is an interesting pivot that I had a few years ago uh, in terms of where's the growth going to come from. And then I'll get to the future of insurance, which can sound pretty whimsical. So in the, in the near term, I made a pivot from thinking that we're going to have massive business model change, and that's where the growth is going to come from, to the idea that we're going to get growth through segment growth. And in the zero to five year time frame, what I mean by segment growth is, Norbert, that we will find new customers for some of our existing and some of our modified insurance products. There will be new segments of customers who will potentially grow the overall insurance pie, as we reduce complexity, we increase the simplicity of the product, potentially make it more claimless, and maybe make it more inclusive. And so as I thought about growth and look at the data for where growth is coming from in Western Europe, North America, and I see 
Digital isn't growing a lot. The existing core business is not growing. In fact, we are in often in markets where there's you know, significant contraction across many lines. So the growth is coming from newly minted emerging middle class across Asia and to some degree Africa who finally have things worthy to protect. As you start with that premise that we have seven plus billion people on the planet and many because of the great story of the last 20 years have been lifted out of poverty and now have a mobile phone. The first thing that we will protect is the mobile screen and then the phone, and then the two-wheeler, and then the income, and then the three-wheeler, and then, of course, the car, the life, the health, the spouse, the key man insurance, and all the other things that ladder around this sense of protection. But when we start with the core of why I am optimistic about the growth of insurance, I think it's because as we, and I mean the innovators, the top 15% in the insurance industry, start to look at the new markets like Myanmar and Indonesia, the new markets of, of Nigeria, East Africa, where all the growth is coming, where you have a number of young people who are educated and coming online, obviously have access to mobile phones, and they will start to have this idea of protection. And I'll, I'll go on a little bit of an aside here, and I think some people will understand this, and I'll, I'll ask this out on a podcast, put your hand up if you know how to cope. I bet you there's quite a few people who have their hand up right now because there are probably a lot of young listeners who basically do know how to code, whether it's something as simple as Visual Basic or, or, or Python, which I've been brushing up on during, the, during COVID. And we all know how to do an if-then-else statement if you know how to code. And an insurance contract is nothing more than a bunch of nested if-then-else statements. If you talk to any lawyer, they might not get this, but any coder would appreciate that. And therefore, we, coders and young people today, we recognize that there are a lot of things out there, contracts, social contracts, pieces of code, products and services that are nothing more than if-then-else statements, or IFTTT. And therefore, we should build simple insurance products, maybe a little bit like Zhongan, maybe like other you know, Chinese shopping and other uh, startups that embody this idea that if this happens, then you get this. And if it's automated and the triggers are automated and parametric and or we have a simple way of explaining and distributing it, we will eventually start to get one U.S. dollar, five U.S. dollar health protection, hospital insurance, COVID insurance, dengue insurance, motorcycle helmet insurance, all kinds of things that people really need from home credit in Czech Republic and Kazakhstan to Alt in Southeast Asia to HalloDoc in Indonesia. These are all really interesting, exciting insure techs that are basically providing financing insurance to more and more people. And these people who are not well served or underserved by banks and, and traditional insurers will understand the concept of insurance like IFTT, and they will continue to grow. And if 10% of them end, end up being in the middle class, we'll have more sizable policies and so on and so forth. I'll pause there and give them my unequivocal answer for the next, you know, let's call it zero to 10 years is we will still see growth in insurance. And I won't just go by geography, but in this idea that we have a number of underserved all around the world. And as we simplify and use tech, we will start to have more inclusive insurance. Will that ultimately change the role of the insurer and maybe bring it back to the roots a bit? Because many of the insurers were mutual companies at some point, then they were changed into for-profit entities. That also changes a bit how they act or how people perceive their acting. And if you look at the Lemonade or some of the things that are going on in China, it's almost more that the insurer manages the pool and takes a service fee. In the case of Lemonade, I think it's 10%. And some of the Chinese models even go as low as eight. So you're not having an unlimited return. You're basically taking a fee for the insurance service that is very much smaller than what is the current operational cost for running an insurance business. Uh, it's a great piece of visionary thinking there. And it ties back to another category, which should probably grow, which is insurance for Muslims. And perhaps not as many in, in the Japan context, but in the rest of Asia and Africa, there are 600 million middle-class Muslims, 1.8 billion. And Takaful insurance is really just conventional insurance with the Sharia label slapped on it. It's really not built from the ground up to think like a classic peer-to-peer -peer shared economy type of product. 
kind of like lemonade is. And so what I think what will happen is this principle that you well described of having a orchestrator, an administrator, which is kind of core to the Takaful concept, will continue. And, and this is a great segue into a long-term view about where insurance is going. I think in about 100 years, and 100 years is such a long time to even contemplate, we will have insurance hopefully returning as a public good back to government in that we will be able to effectively price risk. We will administrate it like a social service. We will be able to get the benefits of pooling and have insurance be a safety net, a trampoline that the government can afford. This is kind of the point, can afford to price and to deliver to all of its uh, citizens. And we know we're getting there with certain parts of insurance already, right? I mean, you think about risk transfer, governments are soaking up a little bit of the risk already when it comes to, to COVID or to FDIC uh, or even health insurance in like 35 countries where we have proper health insurance. But it will get there to the point where in a hundred years that that's the steady state, then what you've talked about is an interim state where you have pools of people who understand how to self-organize and pay an administrator to, to sort of distribute. And over time, that segment growth will start to make, you know, for-profit insurers also better understand how they can serve more and more customers. So that's kind of an answer to part of the question. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about where I think the business opportunity for insurers will be in the next few years. And I, and I go back to help. I, I say this a lot because I go back to what is the real job to be done? And all the research that we've done around the true job to be done when you ask a customer everywhere, it comes back to this kind of statement that I say, which is, I want to live a longer, happier, thicker, fuller life with me and my family. We as insurers or insurers have brand permission to be able to deliver on this uniquely with a long-term relationship. It's a pretty envious position to be able to say, I might be able to help you to live a longer, happier, thicker, fuller life with your family. And at its core, that is a ask for health. As we think about where health is, is, has come from these last few years, and I don't just mean health insurance, health is everything. Health is wealth. Health is, of course, something that we all value within, in, the, in the COVID crisis, but health is much, much more than infectious diseases. Health is beauty in Asia. Health is the reason we say more than 50% of the people when they ask, why do you even say it? It's to be able to handle a future unexpected health expense. It is so core to our happiness and to what we seek that having health be part of your remit is a big part of what I think will differentiate and ensure that's always looking back versus one that's really understanding their customer and saying, I, I can help you with that. And I'll be even more visionary and say, the digital technologies that we, we have right now are going to move at this incredible pace, right? Of course, they will. I'm going to take AI uh, uh, and AR out of it for a second. But those digital technologies are phenomenally fast in terms of their change. But Norbert, I believe that the health wave is going to move even faster than, this, than any sort of Moore's law. And we're at maybe year two or three of a 15-year wave where our understanding of our bodies, of our systems, of the five chronic diseases that potentially cause 75% of all the loss in insurance, all these lifestyle factors, all these nudges, all the things that we do before we enter into the healthcare system is a multi-trillion dollar market. And if we as an ecosystem, including the insurers, were to try and tackle preventative health, then what we can potentially do is bend the risk curve. And that is really the ultimate reason why we'll get to that 100-year point where governments can afford it, is because we know how to bend the risk curve. If you could tell me right now that my longevity is going to be on my 91st birthday, I'm going to die of kidney failure, and you can change that curve of my health over time to go from a L to something more, uh, to more flat, then it's worthwhile to me. And if you can move that 91 to 110, maybe that's also valuable. That area under the curve, if you can visualize it, is value that you've delivered to me. And I would think that potentially the value proposition of insurer in the future is that if you are a policyholder of XYZ company, you will live five years longer than if you were a policyholder of ABC company because of all the different ways in which the ecosystem can contribute to nudge you to have a better life. And so that broader proposition of living a happier, thicker, fuller life means that the insurance industry has to think about how we take advantage, not just of the digital innovation, but of the health innovations and create for Zia outcomes that improve upon that 91-year lifespan and give me more health in the years that I really want it.
And I think that's a really nice, positive vision for how insurers can stay relevant. Well, that was deep. Thank you. You're truly an optimist. So I love the vision. I love the vision at an individual level. And maybe if I now take this at a global scale, that is a good transition into ESG, because if we all suddenly live until we're 100, 110 years old, then we might have a population issue. Or if we continue living the way we are living and not taking care of the environment, the social aspects of things, then we're getting ever closer and ever faster closer to the destruction of the planet we live on. So how do you then, with this positive individual vision, make sure that from an overall environmental perspective, you're not committing suicide? Yeah, thank you for bringing up ESG and and for the broader topic of sustainability. Look, the COVID crisis has its roots in the uh, biodiversity of the planet. In many ways, this loss of biodiversity, this rapid urbanization, of course, the rising population levels as we age, as we get closer contact with animals through deforestation, we are going to see a greater consciousness between ourselves and our responsibilities on the planet and the planet uh, itself as a result of COVID. I think we're learning from that. And fundamentally, if you think about ESG with E being the environment and some of the the, the topics that we just discussed, S's means societal. And and while governance has still always been there, the S is really the part that has more heightened importance. Companies that have good employee-employer relationships, good brands, flexible work policies, companies that take care of their ecosystem are tuned into the zeitgeist of the moment. These are the companies that are being rewarded, not just on the stock market, but by investors who are choosing them, by partners who are choosing them, by employees, millennials who are choosing to work for them. So in so many ways, one of the bases for competition as a brand is how much do you genuinely believe that we have a responsibility towards sustainability in the planet and that the societal importance means that we are no longer just interested in shareholder value, we're interested in stakeholder value. And if you look at the data, Norbert, it seems that during this crisis, the downside risk of ESG stocks has shown to be less volatile. And maybe that downside risk has been halved for ESG stocks versus the uh, the general uh, market. And they've outperformed as well. So we're starting to see real data that finally says that ESG investing isn't just good, but it's also good for your pocketbook and it reduces risk. This is the overall trend that we're seeing from a broader global equity perspective. And that, that's really the advice that I give C-suite leaders is pay attention to how you are perceived as an ESG leader. Pay attention to the things that you're doing because we don't really have much of a choice and it will be good for, for your business. I could get into health, but fundamentally great leaders will recognize that to improve people's outcomes. And a big part of S is to create inclusion and to have our products and service no longer just serve the healthy and the affluent, but to be there as a protection for more people so that they can live a more confident life. And I think at its core, we're lucky to be in the insurance industry in such a noble purpose profession. And to fulfill that promise, I think that the industry needs to continue to look at itself and say, in this moment, this crisis, this this, this turn and pivot towards ESG, What more could we do to potentially contribute to the societal good? And I'll kind of leave it there. As we did the introduction, I mentioned that as you transition now into your new life, your plan is to create an ESG fund and in a way put your money and investors' money where your mouth is. Where the areas that you focus on based on the conversation so far that seem to be health and diversity inclusion, is that the direction it's going? Yes, it is. So preventative health and financial inclusion and equity are are the areas of of primary investment interest with other secondary interest in in renewable energy, maybe affordable nutrition and a couple of others where I've put some thought into it that will drive tremendous change. But if you take a full step back, that there's two things that I want to do next. And the first is from an advisory services point of view, work with large companies, large reinsurers, insurers, look at the comp- on the investment side to think about more than just alternative asset, alternative strategies. What are you really doing that goes beyond venture philanthropy and CSR to do impact investments at scale? And then from a corporate perspective, 
what's your sustainability strategy? And what could you do more to help your company not just be perceived, but to actually do good? So there's an element of maybe creating an observatory where like-minded leaders on sustainability issues can dialogue and get advice from me and others, because I think we all can contribute to the solution. So that's one pillar of an observatory model. And then the investment model is potentially to raise funds to go off and invest in I don't want to say tech, but they're going to be probably B2B tech companies that enable companies, ESG-led companies, to be a better version of themselves. Now, it might sound conceptual, but if fundamentally, if you, take, if you believe in this broader transition, if you could become a more successful and a more streamlined, a more impactful, a less polluting, a more a circular economy conscious company, and what you needed to get there is some level of tools or tech or other types of enabling stuff to get you there. Well, it's those companies that are going to probably, you know, that we call them in the tech industry, the pickaxe companies that are going to supply the miners with what they need to do good. And those are the kinds of companies that that I like. Uh, I also like companies that make it more possible for companies to create value directly with those who are underrepresented. In the healthcare pathway, access companies that lower the barrier to get access to, to medicine. I like nudge companies that potentially have impacts on health outcomes at scale. I like population health companies that make it easier and more affordable to get good nutrition distributed into the people that need it. And of course, I like companies that fundamentally change and bend the risk curve around the major diseases that we have, like diabetes, coronary coronary artery disease, dementia, mental health, and of course, cancer. So those are the types of things that if you're capable of changing people's outcomes or letting a large company have more of an impact through your tools, that's the kind of company that I think that will attract a lot of investment and potentially have some really interesting exits in the future, Norbert. Yeah, and it's super inciting uh, en- environment to be in, truly is. To round it out, again, coming back to the introduction, we mentioned you're publishing a lot. Some of your recent publications were around risk. Can you talk a bit about the areas that you focus on in, in that regard and why that is important to you as well? Yeah, thank you for uh, asking. I, I like to write just something of a pastime or a hobby, but you know, the geeky, nerdy self of mine started thinking about math a long time ago in, in, in applications in real life. And one in particular was around ice hockey. And I'll set it up in no more than two minutes for those of you in Japan who might either play or watch some NHL games. If your team is down by one goal and you're about to lose the game anyway, the strategy is that you pull the goalie in favor of an extra attacker to increase the probability that you're going to score, while also, of course, increasing the probability that you'll be scored upon. But you were going to lose the game anyway, and therefore getting that extra attacker actually increases your probability of scoring by a factor of 2.7. So the question then becomes, when's the optimal time to pull the goalie before the end of the game? And so I solved this problem in 2001, of all times, using what's called a Markov chain, which is a birth-death process that uses probability theory as opposed to a Poisson model, which is a little bit more statistical. And the Markov chain seems to give a pretty robust answer. So I didn't think about it. And 16 years later, I eventually forgot about it. And a friend of mine said, hey, Zia, Malcolm Gladwell just did a podcast on Pull the Goalie. And it turns out these billionaire hedge fund guys, Cliff and Aaron, wrote a paper using dynamic programming to update the model. And they cited me twice in the paper. And they used dynamic programming and more of a statistical model to say, That indeed, five minutes before the end of an ice hockey game, you should pull the goalie. And so what I did was I went back and said, hey, wait, 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 wait. you need to be more stateful. And meaning you need to check to see where the puck is. If the puck is in the offensive zone, then maybe you want to pull the goalie a little bit earlier because the probability of the puck actually being scored upon, that little window of risk is lessened. And Malcolm Gladwell did a brilliant job of, of bringing in some real world examples of how you can need to make a disagreeable choice and in risk management, either as an investment manager or, you know, a movie director, et cetera. And so the two insights very quickly are that little bits of insight can help you de-risk a situation. So if you know the puck is in the offensive zone, they might even want to pull the the goalie a little earlier. If you're not sure about funding an indie movie and you find out that, you know, Meryl Streep has agreed to be a lead actress, then that de-risks it. 
But the second thing insight that I got from the hockey was that these insights are fleeting, meaning the puck can travel back and end up in your goal. So that moment of insight is very, very short. So take advantage of it, but know that you might have to revert back. Uh, and it's just a really interesting, stateful examination of risk, which applies to a bunch of different things. So I've been working on math stuff and, you know, Norbert, I've actually been writing fiction uh, in this COVID time about various perspectives on how life has changed. Wonderful. I think that was a great conversation, Sia. Thank you very much for taking the time and best of luck for your new ventures. And I hope that post-pandemic, our paths will cross again then. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on this great podcast. Take care. Now.